right. I think this is on. Okay, it's on. Hey, everybody. Welcome to day five of the O'Rourke Homeschool for the Gifted. Um, this is the time where I typically teach the American history lesson. Um, and this first subject that I'm trying to, to tackle is um, the history of the indigenous peoples of the Americas. And over the last uh, four days, Molly and Henry and their brother Ulysses, who's going to join us soon, uh, aided by um, their mother Amy, uh, have been going through the history of um, the migration to the Americas. So out of Africa, 70,000 years ago to the east coast of Asia, 40,000 years ago across the um, you know, Bering Land Bridge, 20,000 years ago all the way to the tip of South America 10,000 years ago. And we've been talking about um, the development of civilization in the Americas. We've studied the Olmecs civilization. What, what is the, the community on the, lake, on the shores of Lake Titicaca that we were talking about? Um, take a one. Do you have it in your, in your notebook? Tiwanaku. Tiwanaku uh, on the shores of Lake Titicaca was mm -hmm. at the year 1000 AD bigger than Paris, France. Uh, we talked about the development of the concept of the number zero, which is a mind blower for me that happened independently in the Americas, the Neolithic Revolution that happened here uh, not too long after it happened in the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East, um, writing, pyramids, all that stuff. Today, um, we're going to jump ahead to the year 1680 and the Pueblo Revolt in Santa Fe and other surrounding Pueblos. And we're going to invite in a really good friend of ours named Robert Gunn, who is a professor at the University of Texas at El Paso. And Amy, I was supposed to have his, uh, his bio up so that I could read it. You want me to pull it up? Yeah. Will you read it? If I pull it up, will you read it? And then we're going to have Robert come in. Um, here we go. Will you read Robert Gunn as an associate professor? Mm-hmm. Hello everybody. Robert Gunn is Associate Professor of English at the University of Texas at El Paso. He is the author of Ethnology and Empire, Languages, Literature, and the Making of the North American Borderlands, published by the NYU Press, which was the winner of the 2016 Early American Literature First Book Prize. Most importantly, he is the husband of John Perillo and the father of Francis also known as Franny and Henry G. Word. So um, in, in order to provide better instruction to our kids, and then we thought we'd throw this open to anyone else who's interested, we've invited uh, Dr. Gunn to come join us today and talk to us about the Pueblo Revolt. So um, if I can figure this out, um, and, and Robert, if you're on, if you could make a con here we go. Let's see if we can figure this out, guys. I see Kano. Um, I see Deborah Peterson. I see Tim. I see Samantha Amy. Styles. I see Samantha Styles. What's up, Styles? Um, I see Connor Flynn. I see Christy. Um, you know what, Cynthia? Do did I need to be friends with Robert before we started this? Yeah, you did. Oh, okay. That would have been good to know. Um, we do we need to restart? To, I don't think so because find. it's just easier to find because then you have to go. Well, he just has to. Remember. Will you will you text Robert? Yeah, do the, um, question mark. Ah. No, that's questions. Those are no, questions. Asking. Oh. Let's see. Go, oh, we found him. Boom. Oh. Samantha says, hi, Molly and Henry. Hello. Okay, we're waiting, waiting for Rob Gunn. That's, that's his screen. Hi, Henry from Milwaukee. Roberto. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> we, are you in a black hole? There he is. Oh, wait. All right. Hang on a sec. We see your got, keyboard. For some reason, my camera's facing the wrong way. I think we need Franny to help him out. No? It's 
Well, caca. <laughs> All right, Molly, okay. while, while we try to get uh, Dr. Gunn on, what, what do we know about the Pueblo Revolt? Towns. Mm -hmm. Towns. Uh, in, in what state? Like what? What's in, in what is New Mexico now? We're going to try to get Robert Gunn on again. Um, so these are um, villages in New Mexico. And what year did the Spanish come in? There you go, Robert. Um, well, something's blocking your camera when it's facing you for some reason. Yeah, for some reason. So do I? Oh, there we go. Oh, hey, look at we that. can see you. Hey, that is a hell of a beard you got going on. Hey, oh, Francis. This? Oh, my God. Is that what I really look like? Yes. Yeah, that's what you really look yes. like. Now, it's is like this... Howard Hughes back from the dead. <laughs> is this all post, uh, you know, uh, shelter in place and social distance, or has this been Ten going days, on for a while? Ten days. Ten days? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, this is, uh, yeah, this is still, it's, it's, it's a novelty beard um, since, like, you know, uh, January there about. But yeah. it's it's divided in the middle, so I, I, it's not going to last. It's not going to last. Well, you uh, look really good. I, I like it. I think you should keep it. What do you guys think? Keep it or, or lose keep it? it? Keep it. Keep it. You got a thumbs up from Henry and a kind of a. Uh, yeah, see, that's the thing here. Henry likes it. Franny does not. Jana is very is tolerant, but her her silence on the matter is, is eloquent. So um, <laughs> it, it's uh, it, it's it's not it's a novelty beer. It's not going to last. So let, let me share with you, Robert, what we know. Hey, Franny. You want it shaved? Yeah. Um, let, let us tell you what we know about the, the Pueblo Revolt, and then we want to ask you some questions, okay? And then correct us on, on any of the facts that we, that we have wrong. So our understanding is that the Spanish come into northern New Mexico around 1540, and um, and their invasion is is really brutal. Um, there are some um, yeah. significant battles. Uh, there is um, the uh, Pueblo people to produce food like maize or, or corn, uh, textiles. What else, guys? There's something else. Um, uh, oh, avocado. Avocado, but. But maybe not avocados there. But in, anyhow, they, they, they were in, uh, I don't know if the word is enslavement. And I know there were slaves. I don't know if that's what first happened in 1540. But the Spanish occupation of that mm -hmm. area uh, is just brutal. From, from uh, Juan de Oñate in 1598, uh, cutting off the feet of every man or cutting off the foot of every man over the age of 25 in the Acoma Pueblo after their uprising. Um, just, just terrible. And there is this precipitating event uh, around 1680 where the Spanish governor, whose name was Trevino, I think Trevino, um, arrests some of the medicine men. This is according to Wikipedia, by the way. That's my source. Uh, and, and hangs three of them. One of them commits suicide and then publicly whips the others, one of whom is Pope. Okay. And uh, and then he then goes, he, he's then released because there's um, uh, kind of a small uprising. And then he goes out to the other Pueblos to organize uh, resistance and uh, rebellion, if that's the right word. So, so take us from there. And first of all, tell me if what I just described is correct. And then tell us what happens from there. Okay, so um, what you described sound... Uh, Broadly correct in, in all of its in all of its outlines. Um, what I and, and I can fill in some of that, but I should emphasize that what I don't know about Native American history is you know could fill a continent and uh, literally um, and uh, and I, and, I, and I hope that there's I'm just so excited to be uh, a guest here in the Aurora School for the Gifted and to be part of this because uh, I just think it's great that you're teaching Molly and, and Henry about Native American history. And, and, I, and I hope more people who are taking it, you know, who are, are homeschooling with their kids now are taking advantage of that time to teach some of this history, which is incredibly rich and diverse, 
beyond um, uh, I think you know, anything that I, I certainly had growing up, and um, you know, and, and in and, and, and in doing so to push back against some of the stories that we get about Native peoples, which tend to be really stereotyped and, and singular. Um, I think the, the the movies tend to paint one picture of Native people, you know, that that they all are. Uh, they have one kind of religion. They all wear horses and buffalo um, and live in teepees. And, you know, they all, this all happened a long time ago. They're not there. And none of that is true. Some, some of that is true for some tribes in the plains, but there were thousands of uh, different uh, communities across the continent. Um, and, you know, just, uh, I'm just backing up slightly. Can you hear me, by the way? I'm getting some feedback. Yeah, we, we can hear you. I'll turn my volume down. Your voice gets muffled every five words. Uh, is that my volume? Is your phone on the floor? No, it's leaning up is against Is your the microphone phone. on the floor at all? No, no, it's uh, just on the phone. Hey, we paid big bucks to get you in, so this thing has got to work right. It's got to work. It's got to work. All right. Um, no, thank you for doing this for free. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> to be clear. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be here. But um, just to give you, okay, one just quick snapshot uh, of, of, of this picture of diversity that I'm talking about. Um, there are about 29 different language families, uh, or were at the time of contact, across North America. Um, and to put that in perspective, that means within those language families, there are, are dozens more languages. And there were, at the time of contact, 350 mutually uh, unintelligible languages across North America. That wow. means if I speak one language and you speak another, we can't really share any words in common at all. It's as different from, you know, uh, Spanish and Russian, right? Um, 350 languages across North America. This is and, uh, uh, at 1492? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, and so it's, it's an incredibly diverse, and each one of those languages reflects a people with its own rich history, with its own rich culture. Um, and, and so that's, uh, I think a really important thing to recognize very different kinds of people living very different kinds of lives and that they are still with us. A lot of the history we're going to be talking about today is living history for, uh, the sovereign nation, Pueblo nations of New Mexico and, and Texas and Arizona, including Hopi and Isleta del Sur. They're 21 sovereign Pueblo Indian nations. Um, and this is an important part of, of their history and, and of our history. Uh, so let's just begin by acknowledging and affirming that no matter where you're watching this, where we are here and anywhere across the country, this is Indian land, right? We are sitting here uh, in, in my house, in Five Points, your house over the hill, in the traditional homelands of, of the Humanos and Manzos and Suma peoples. Uh, Mescalero Apaches lived in this valley. And down the road at Isleta del Sur Pueblo um, are the Tigua people who have been here since 1680 and whose history is very much a part of the story that we're going to be talking about today. So I, I, I this is just um, that let's let's dig in. I think you guys have already done some some great research. But um, if I could, Molly and, and Henry, I want to ask you a couple of quick favors, which is to say I, I, there are other kids watching and um, I'm going to count on you guys to um, interrupt me <laughs> um, when you have questions. And I hope you will do that um, often. Uh, in the first place, because you do not want me, if you, if you get me going, I will chatter like a monkey for um, endlessly, and, and nobody nobody wants that. But but secondly, if you have a question about anything, um, you, you, you need to be confident. You need to know that you are not the only person with that question. And I may not know when people have questions. So you got to ask me stuff. You got to interrupt me. Let's let's have this a conversation back and forth if, if we can. Um, does that sound good? Guys. Yeah. Okay, okay. We're getting thumbs up from these guys. Awesome. So, and, and it sounds like you're already way ahead of me because one of my first questions for you um, was if you knew what a, a, a Pueblo is. And, and it sounds like you do. Have you, have either of you guys, uh, uh, what, what we're talking about, what we describe a Pueblo? Have you, have you guys, or are you asking, sorry, it, it our signal dropped yeah, out yeah, for a second. Well, for, yeah, it's, uh, I'm asking, who knows what a Pueblo is? I'm getting a picture of one here, in case. Okay. Do you guys know what a Pueblo is? Okay, so I don't know if you're going to see this, because it's a digital picture. But that is a picture of Taos Pueblo. That's Have the you all been to Pueblo. Taos Pueblo? 
So, so Amy uh, grew up in Lamy, uh, not too far from Santa Fe, and then not too far from Taos. Um, so she's been there. I've been there, but it turns out uh, Henry and Molly have have not. But that's what a pueblo looks like. That's what a pueblo looks like. That that is Taos pueblo. It's been there about a thousand years, um, and most of the pueblos resemble that. That one is across the, the river from another pueblo. Many of them had two structures like that with the central courtyard, often two kivas, um, and uh, and there at the time of the Spanish first contact with New Mexico, there were around a hundred of them. Um, a little more than 100, in what would become the Kingdom of New Mexico, which is basically New Mexico and, and Arizona. Uh, and as I mentioned today, there are 21 that remain that are, that are still sovereign. Now, that one that I showed you just now is actually really important because it's, it's there at Taos after 1675 when Pope is uh, finally released uh, from, from prison in Santa Fe, that he retreats to Taos. He's not from Taos. He's from um, he's a medicine man from Okewinge, which is about 10 miles north of Santa Fe. Uh, but he retreats to Taos. And from there, he begins, he has a vision, and he begins his, uh, his diplomatic mission to unite the Pueblos. What's to, his vision? To Spanish. His, vi his vision is that if he uh, can expel the, the Spanish, well, if, if, he, if he can lead a, a movement of religious reform, uh, and purification, wh whereby the uh, the Pueblo peoples could return to their uh, traditional religious practices and, and 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 expunge Catholicism from from their worship, um, that they uh, that bounty will be restored. The 1670s are a really tough decade in New Mexico because there's a terrible drought. There's not enough food to go around. Um, it's the, we're at the sort of the tattered edges of the northern part of the Spanish Empire, and um, and and that perimeter is not well protected from incursions by Comanches and from Navajos, and so various Pueblo peoples are feeling are feeling heat and pressure from a lot of sides. It's not a sustainable situation, and the hope is that if he can restore um, religious purity, get rid of the Spaniards, then peace and prosperity will return. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. I think you, you had the right idea when you wanted to go back um, to the beginning of, of, the, of, the, of the conquest uh, and the beginning of encounter, because there's a backstory to, to the revolt, right? And, um, and you're right, it begins in 1540. Or it begins actually a little bit before that. It begins with uh, Estevanico traveling with Cabeza de Vaca uh, and Durantes and Castillo, four castaways from an ill-fated expedition that was meant to land in Florida. They got shipwrecked and marooned, and they ended up, four of them, the lone survivors, uh, as far as they knew, imprisoned in West Texas, sorry, East Texas, Galveston Island, after which they escaped, wandered for uh, a total of seven years after they eventually set out, and wandered into New Mexico. Um, tradition, local tradition, is that they wandered up through Paso del Norte, right through where we live right now, and mm -hmm. encountered some pueblos. And that's that's a fascinating story in its own right. It's, what year is that? So that's uh, so they the the expedition they set out on is 1527. That's the Narvaez expedition, and they eventually make it back in um, 1536, I think. Um, but at, at some point, towards the very end of that, they make it up into New Mexico which is important because Estevanico, who is the African slave, um, an African slave accompanying the, the three Spaniards, returns. He returns in 1539 uh, ahead of an expedition led by, uh, by Marcos de Niza, and he begins telling these remarkable stories that, uh, because he's saying, I know of amazing riches to the north. I know of incredible wealth. I know of great gold that can be found. And in particular, he describes the seven cities of Cibola, Right. And these are supposed to be seven cities of gold with un, un, unimaginable wealth, which the Spaniards, by the way, are very willing to believe and very ready to believe because they have extraordinary evidence of the wealth of the new world. Having in 1520, um, uh, Cortez having attacked and ransacked and taken over Tenochtitlan and overthrown Moctezuma, which is a city that was one of the great cities on Earth at the time, filled with gold and unimaginable wealth. And they think there's more to be found. So there's a great deal of pressure to go up there. And Estevanico um, is, is executed at Zuni. The seven cities of Bola that he describes are at, at, at Zuni Pueblo, um, at, at Habaku. And he is executed there because he makes himself obnoxious when he arrives. 
But meanwhile, what he had told, the story that he had told about that place and the path that he had led up there makes it back to Mexico City. And um, eventually Coronado, 1540, shows up. And that's a name that I think all you guys know, right? From Coronado High School and just from uh, local legend. He shows up in July of 1540 and with uh, just a military um, um military uh, expedition. Um, they raid and attack uh, uh, Hawaku, which is one of the seven cities of, of Zuni. Um, they don't find tremendous gold. They don't find tremendous wealth, but they do find a lot of people. And they begin traveling east, looking for more gold. They make it as far as Kansas, following um, uh, stories that they hear about a, a place further and further to the east and to the north, uh, but never find the gold that they're looking for. But still, this is creating, even as they go, it's brutal, right? They don't have enough food to keep them going. So every time they show up at Pueblo, they demand tribute. They demand corn. They demand clothing, often more than any Pueblo can provide. And if they don't get it, they attack. And so they make a name for themselves, and they make a name for the Spaniards. And this sets a pattern that will follow um, most, as you pointed out, most um, infamously with Oñate, whose statue both of you guys have seen at the, at the airport. Uh, Juan de Oñate, that great big uh, guy on a horse right Steel by the airport. Statue. Yeah. Right. So that's Juan de Oñate. He arrives in April of 1598. But unlike Coronado, who just has a, a military contingent, Oñate has livestock. Oñate has settlers. He has people there that want to get rich, if not from mineral wealth, although people are hoping for that, from land. Um, they they uh, are going to settle the place. So it's a different kind of expedition altogether. Um, and let me, as you let me ask a question, Robert, real quick. Yeah, yeah. Um, whether it is in uh, 1540 or 1598 with Oñate or, or later on, are, are the Pueblo people defenseless? Why, why, I, one immediate question is why, why did they not, um, why were they unable to fight off the, the Spanish who were coming in? The Spanish were coming in with far smaller numbers, uh, was it that the Spanish had um, guns Ken. and steel and then, and then disease? Were, were the Pueblo people ravaged yeah. by disease that the Spanish All brought back? Is why, why, were, why were the Pueblo people unsuccessful in staving off this <clears throat> incursion? Right. Uh, that's a great question. So um, they, the Pueblo peoples, uh, they were at a technological disadvantages, disadvantage with respect to uh, warfare. They, uh, the Spaniards have cannons. They've got um, firing tubes, har uh, harbicuses that are sort of um, their guns, basically. Um, and and uh, they, yeah, have, have, have excellent tactics. The, the, the Pueblos um, defend themselves as best they can, but they are fighting with bows and arrows and spears and atlatls and things like that. They, they don't, they can't stand up to the firepower, uh, but they try to. And a place they try to make a stand is at Acoma. Uh, at the end of 1598, right? They cross at El Paso in April 1598. By 15, the end of 1598, um, they are exploring uh, western New Mexico. And at Acoma Pueblo, um, Coronado had been through there. And if you've been there, you, you know, um, uh, I encourage people who have a computer with them to, to Google a picture of this place. It is one of the most remarkable places on earth I've, I've ever been. And when Coronado beheld it for the first time, he described it, um, the most magnificent fortress in all the world. Is it Pueblo, like I showed you in the picture of, of Taos, but it's on, picture this, on top of a, of a 350 foot mesa. And the only way he could get up there was through these single file passageways, right? Um, and it was it was an incredibly well def def uh, it was a defensible position, and um, and when <clears throat> Juan de Salvar Salvar, who was a nephew of, of Oñate, shows up demanding food um, and stealing things from them, um, they decide they're going to kill him um, for his uh, for his insults and offenses against them. They do, and they kill uh, uh, him and the, the small group that's with him. Where it gets back to Oñate, his brother. Uh, Vicente de Saldivar, again, another uh, nephew of Oñate, they show up with 70 people, with cannons, um, and they make their demands, eventually force their way on top of the Pueblo. And once they do, uh, a massacre ensues. 800 men, women, and children are killed. Um, fire is set to the Pueblo. A uh, decree is passed down that no one shall live there for 20 years. And as you mentioned, um, all male survivors over the age of 25 have one foot cut off. Um, males uh, between the ages of 15 to 25 are sent into uh, a 20-year 
uh, period of servitude, if I recall correctly, and then the people younger than that are distributed to the Franciscan friars for re-education down in Mexico. Um, two Hopis who happen to be there at the time have right hands cut off and they're sent back to Hopi to send the message that this is not to be resisted. Uh, it is it is an, an atrocity of of, of, of astonishing and, and shocking uh, scale that was even shocking to the Spaniards in New Mexico. And it's partly for um, his actions at Acoma that, um, uh, that, that Oñate was recalled from his position as governor of New Mexico uh, in 1607, I think. And, um, and, and he was, he was convicted of war crimes. Um, but the pattern had been set and a pattern of brutality had been established. And more importantly, uh, colonization was underway with him. Peralta follows as the first post Oñate governor. He establishes, uh, the palace of the governors at Santa Fe. And, and that's where things begin to change. And as you mentioned, disease, about a hundred thousand people, um, in, in the Pueblos under that probably at the time in the 1540 or so, by the end, uh, by the time of the Spanish, uh, excuse me, the Pueblo revolt, there's, you know, um, maybe 15, 20,000. So most hold of on that a second. Is, so that is, they, they went from 100,000 to maybe 15 or 20,000? Yeah, mostly through and disease. Mostly through and disease. There's starvation, violence. Um, the Spaniards demand that they centralize their living spaces. So like one group of people might have four or five different Pueblos. Uh, spread out like at, 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 at Jemez at different locations. And the Spanish demand, we're going to build a mission church here and you're going to move everybody right here. And they're going to centralize everything. And the Spanish at that point begin the, implementing what, the, what was called the encomienda system, right? Which is basically a system that combines excessive taxation and um, almost slave-like labor, right? Um, and, and in this way, they demanded the harvest they demanded, they demanded a number of things. They demanded conversion and worship of Catholicism, the banishment of native religions. Uh, but they demanded crops, and they demanded um, uh, an enormous percentage of those crops, uh, when centralizing their uh, distribution through the missions, which made the Pueblo peoples dependent on them for food. So there are far fewer Spaniards there, um, but, they, but they're undergoing a, you know, a period of tremendous turmoil and death dislocation, yeah. death from disease, death from re having to relocate, um, and then the process of conversion, which is not a peaceful process, this process of colonization and conversion. Uh, they begin to revolt, you know, in, in the 1640s, but they're small scale, they're not spread out. Um, but it's Pope who comes along and, and after 1675 really turns the corner. I'm going to show you one more picture. I've wanted to ask you this, Beto, if you've seen uh, this at your the last job you had, do you remember seeing this statue? Yeah. So, so each state gets two statues that they get to place in the capital. And this statue, I believe, if I can make it out from here, is of Pope, uh, which is yes. one of the two that New Mexico um, sent to the to the capital. Is that right? That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. And uh, the artist was, uh, he's a Puebloan uh, artist from, from Jemez. His name was uh, Cliff Ragua, and he finished that in 2005, was unveiled at first at OK one game, and then sent up to Washington. He is the hero of the, of the Pueblo revolt, and he is one of the most extraordinary political figures in American history. And, and the story of what happens after 1675, the story of the Pueblo revolt, is, is really astonishing. Um, you could tell it in, in a way that sounds, there are a lot of different ways to tell the story, but think about what it represents in its outline. It's a story in a nutshell of, 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 of a people suffering under terrible persecution for generations, uh, political subjection, religious persecution, excessive taxation, breaking apart from their oppressors, forming, uh, electing new leaders and forming a new confederation um, in order they might live freely and practice their religion freely. Does that sound familiar to you as a student of American history? What, what period of American history? Maybe the, the revolution? The, the American revolution, maybe? Or, Absolutely. or another time? Absolutely. Does that sound right? Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's, it's like the story of the American Re Revolution, part of the story of American Revolution or the story of, of, the, of, the, of the Pilgrims and the Puritans, right? Escaping religious persecution in England. But these are 
stories that we identify um, with a very particular part of America and a very particular set of actors, a very particular geography, which is in the Northeast and, and white people, when in fact, um, there is an extraordinary story um, unfolding, um, expressing these universal principles um, right, right here in, in, in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, so you had it right, 1675. He, along with 47 um, uh, 46 other medicine men are uh, arrested on charges of sorcery and are brought to Santa Fe. Some are executed. Um, he eventually under, well, the Spanish under duress, the, there's a group of people that march on, on Santa Fe and demand the release of all these medicine. And these are traditional medicine men accused of sorcery because they persist in the practice of their traditional uh, religion um, and have not embraced Catholicism. They demand his release. He, he, Pope goes up to Taos Pueblo. He is there for three years. And secretly during this time, he travels to 45 different Pueblos across mostly northern New Mexico. But as far, um, he, he also see, he, he gets as far west as Zoom and Hopi. Um, and, and the message is following his vision that we need to unite, that fighting, you know, these Individual rebellions aren't going to get us anywhere. We need to unite together and we need to drive these people out. And in a nutshell, that's what they do. They succeed in doing something that no other confederation of native peoples in North America was able to do, which is entirely to expunge a fully entrenched colonial presence from their lands. And they pushed them all the way south of, of the Rio Grande, where, uh, and then lives in and freedom for 12 years before they were reconquered by Don Diego de Vargas in, in 1692. Right, that's the story in a nutshell. That's the story in a nutshell. We'll, we'll, we'll dig into some of the, the really interesting things about how it unfolds and the particular drama of it. But let me just check in with you guys. Henry, Molly, uh, Beto, um, what, what are, what are, you, uh, are questions so far? Amy, you're still there. Okay. <laughs> uh, questions so far? Where, where are we at? You guys have questions? Let me, Robert. There's there are other kids who are watching right now. Let me uh, let me check the questions that have come in. If you guys have questions, um, uh, you can ask. Here, here's one from Luke. Uh, Robert, you can see it on your screen. Did the architectural oh, yeah. structure of the pueblos make conquering them more challenging for the Spaniards? Uh, it made it more challenging. In fact, they were built to be defensive. Uh, structures. Um, let me find, find that picture again. You'll see that they are. Okay, so this is Taos Pueblo again, and this is a, 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 a recent picture. Um, and so some of the interior architecture is a little bit different. But you can see that they are graduated terraces. Does that make sense? They're like steps, great big steps going back. And so there's a bigger block on the floor, then a smaller one above that, and a smaller one above that. Does that make sense? Yep. Sometimes there were four and five of these terraces going up, and they would have ladders going down with entr entryways in the roof. Up here, the modern architecture has doors down on, um, on, on the ground level, but that's not how typically or traditionally they were, they were designed, right? You would enter through the roofs of these places, and you could pull up your, your ladder so that no one can follow after you. So those are, yeah, they're, they're built defensively. Robert, um, but the Spaniards, another, yeah. another question. This is Diego. Was Spanish used as a lingua franca between the tribes? Oh, excellent question. Um, by 1680, yes, most of the tribes, um, certainly the ones that were most um, eager to overthrow the Spaniards shared Spanish as a lingua franca because they have uh, the presence of a mission there. They have Franciscan friars who are demanding tribute from them, um, and 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 they are forcing them to to learn Spanish. So that's Do you know what, what a lingua franca is. It's a common language that everybody uses. If right. if you can't understand um, another people's language, but you you all understand this other language, you can use. Um, Spanish, uh, if you don't understand the, what the Apaches or Comanches are saying. Is that right. a good definition? That's right. That's absolutely right. But there are, so there are six languages, really, that the people are speaking in the northern Pueblos otherwise, aside from Spanish. And, and this, I, I love this question. This is, was this, who is this, Luke? Was that, this was who Diego that who asked this question. Diego, this is such an important question. And it plays into, I think, one of the really interesting things that happens once they decide they're going to attack. 
because all right so so if you want to i have a hard enough time obviously communicating via instagram getting my phone to work but imagine you know you're trying to communicate with people across say 40 30 or 40 pueblos you don't have phones you don't have um there, there's you're not within sight of each other you're miles and miles apart sometimes more than 100 miles apart how do you communicate and coordinate a large scale military action and especially when people you know their traditional languages there's six different languages that people speak Pope had a really ingenious idea, which was that uh, he took, he made a series of ropes out of yucca and tied knots in them and explained to each of the runners that he sent out to all of these different pueblos, untie one knot every day. When you get to the end of, of this list of knots, uh, this, this grouping of knots, that will be the day upon which the attack shall commence. Wow. So that, that is how they came. So, so each, each Pueblo got a rope and there were say, we don't know how many knots, but say there were 12 knots, you would untie a knot every day. And when you got to the last knot, you knew that was the day to attack because uh, they might not have been able to write things to each other that they could read because they may have been speaking different languages, but everybody understood that concept. That, that is so exactly. cool. Well, yeah. Robert, I want to read a comment to you that, and I'm, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing the person's name wrong. Gaishpe uh, says, I think it's important to mention us Pueblo people are still thriving in a living culture today. I'm Absolutely. actually listening to Robert from Laguna Pueblo. Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, uh, I, I'm so glad to, to hear that, um, uh, that there are people here from Indian country, that, that, that there's a listener from Laguna Pueblo. Um, that is really, really exciting. And that's, I, I'm glad you brought up that point and emphasize it. That's something that I wanted to, to mention and to emphasize earlier on. I think the you know, one of the main um, uh, components of the, the, the cultural uh, erasure of Native peoples is the, um, uh, the spread of this myth that Native peoples live in the past. This is living history for living people who are here, and, and we have people tuning in right now from the sovereign nation of Laguna Pueblo um, who are represented in Congress by Deb Holland. Right. Um, and and I, I, I think I'm a huge fan of hers. Um, and, uh, uh, and I'm just really excited that, that you're listening right now. And I hope that you yeah. chime in more with these questions, because these are this is a history that I think we should all know. Um, but this is also living history that belongs to to Native peoples and they should be the authors of those histories. So I hope that um, that uh, that this uh, and I've already forgot, was it his name or her name? Um, uh, I, 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 I missed it in the exchange. But, but I hope that person will chime in with, with, with more. Um, yeah, and, uh, and Robert, I'm going to... Really great. So that's, that's the cool. For, for those of you at home, especially your kids who have questions, there's a question mark button at the bottom of your screen. If you press that, you can enter a question. Uh, Henry and Molly and I will select your question to ask of Robert. We have about 22 minutes left. And, and as we look for a question, oh, Robert, uh, uh, Honey98, well, that is their screen name, says... Uh, that they're a member of the Hopi tribe and they're watching you right now as well. So this is, okay, so then let's, let's jump ahead to one part of the story where it touches on the Hopis and the Zunis and the people who are uh, further to the West. Um, so something really interesting happens. Um, uh, so hello to Hopi Nation. That's, that's really exciting. So one thing, they, they've set the date for the attack to be August, if I'm getting this right, August 11th. That's going to be the date of the attack. But the night before, um, uh, excuse me, two days before, two runners, uh, two Pueblo runners are intercepted. They're intercepted by Antonio de Otermin, who is now the colonial governor. It's no longer Trevino. It's Otermin, who is the governor there in, in Santa Fe. And they torture them. These are kids. They're, they're teenagers, 13, 14 years old. But they torture them, and, and they find out um, that this attack is about to commence, right? Um, they... Uh, and word then gets back to Pope that this is about to happen. And so they decide to, um, uh, to move up the date of the attack by one day because they, they've been told that, you know, they, they manage under, under duress, under torture. They reveal when the date of the attack is supposed to, to transpire. Um, and, uh, and so they decide to preempt that by moving up the date of the attack. Again, how do you do that if you have to do this in 24 hours? Um, if you have uh, people spread out so far, it's, it's the amazing, the legendary Pueblo runners who do this, who cover uh, like almost unimaginable distances of land 
um, and, and accomplish this with incredible feats of endurance. They make it to everywhere. The attack is moved up. It, just to cut, to jump to the, the end of, the, of, of this story, the attack is moved up. And everyone except for Hopi and Zuni, uh, and I think Akama, is on time. Because they can't get all the, those hundreds and hundreds of miles away, down, down and around the mountains, all the way out to Hopi. Uh, so Hopi still attacks on the 11th, and uh, Zuni and Akama still attack on the 11th. Um, but everyone else, uh, you know, dozens, 20, 30, 50 miles away, they get the message in time, they attack which is astonishing. And uh, so what happens is they end up killing, uh, the, the plan is to kill the, uh, the priests and whatever local resistance there is at the more distant Pueblos, and then to converge on Santa Fe, which is where the governor is, right? And in Santa Fe, uh, the night of the ninth, the night of the 10th, word comes in from Pueblo after Pueblo from from uh, Picurus, from, uh, from, from, you know, from uh, all these different places, Nambe, Jemez, Testasuke, Taos, uh, Pecos. They end up burning the church at Pecos. To give you an idea of how serious the investment was of the Spaniards in uh, New Mexico, they destroyed the church at Pecos, and a church would not be built that is larger than that church in North America until St. Patrick's Cathedral is built in New York City in 1878. Wow. It is enormous. It is enormous. Um, so to think about the size of this investment, to think about uh, how important uh, New Mexico was to the crown of the Spaniards, um, that, that, that's, that, that's the scale that we're talking about here, right? It's, it's, uh, it's enormous. Um, the... Uh, um, Eventually, word gets back to the governor. It's, it's, it's uh, mean that, that things are going terribly. They converge on the palace of the governors, which is still there. It's right there. Uh, you, uh, Henry, I bet you have been there, uh, down on the, uh, the square in the middle of Santa Fe. The palace of the governors marks one border of, or, or one side. I think it's the, what side is that? The eastern side? No, the western side, I think, of, 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 the, uh, of, the, of the square, right? That building is where Otermin and his people are holed up and waiting. Um, they eventually go out, they try to fight. It doesn't go well. They manage to sort of disperse the first Puebloans who are converging on them, but then more come back. Um, uh, during that fight, he shot in the, with an arrow in the chest, another one in the face, which couldn't have been very pleasant. Um, <laughs> but he survives. He survives. And, uh, and then for 10 days, they're under siege there, right? And the Puebloans, they end up uh, allied with the Apaches, um, they uh, cut off their water supply, and after ten days they bust out. Basically, with the four, with the um, they bust out trying to escape, and and the Puebloans allow them to do this. They want them out, and so they sort of harass this calm in military formation that's marching south. They want to go as far as Isleta, where there is another. Um, um, sort of a, a, another establishment. They haven't. They're not part of the of the revolt, but there are. There's a, a regiment of, of Spaniards there. Um, they want to hook up with them and with the rest of the Spaniards that are still alive that have retreated to that location and those that haven't already retreated. That is to, to Santa Fe. They get as far as Isleta and find that it's deserted. Isleta assumes that everything is is gone to pot up north. Um, that is the the Spaniards at Isleta and they have fled south with. Um, uh, all the, the rest of the, the uh, Hispanic Spaniards, who, the, the Hispanos who were there, and with uh, a number of the, um, the Tiguas, the Asletas, who are either um, or, or, uh, converted to Catholicism or um, are um, their slaves, right? Eventually, Otramin and they, can, they meet on the road somewhere south of Isleta, right? This is south of Albuquerque, and they retreat to guess where? Guess, guess where? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> to Paso del Norte. So just south of the river. Because El Paso, where we live, it hasn't been built yet. So they, they make it as far as that's where they stop. And that's where they stay. That's where they stay, uh, the Spaniards, until they attempt their recon. They actually try to conquer it again. A year later, it doesn't work. They try to, a few times, it doesn't work until uh, Diego de Vargas does in 1692. But that's where the Tiguas are forced to build um, the Isleta, uh, the, the church at Isleta, and that's where they have been ever since. That is where Isleta del Sur Pueblo is. They are, um, in a sense, refugees uh, who move south from, from their, their mother Pueblo um, at Isleta, which you'll see as you drive up 
uh, to Albuquerque and drive up to Santa Fe. You see it off on the right from, from the highway. Um, at least you see the, the great big casino there. So that's part of the story is, is really local. And it's something that I think you guys probably, probably know pretty well if you had a chance to, to drive down on the mission trail and see this light, which you, you really should. Robert, we see some of um, our uh, kids' classmates on here awesome. saying hello. Uh, so we've got some El Paso kids. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click the, the questions. Um, yeah, let's read through these. Which one do you like? Well, I just... Yeah. Oh, that one, I like that How did the Pueblos get their food? Did they hunt large animals or whatever they could find? So they're primarily farmers, um, and, and they plant a lot of corn. They eat a lot of squash. Um, they, have, they are in, enormously knowledgeable and skillful about things they can uh, harvest from, uh, from the desert. Um, uh, and, and, and they also hunt. So that's, it's some, you know, from, from every column, but they differ from, um, uh, so I should mention that the, the name, the Pueblos, that was provided by the Spaniards to differentiate them from what they called Los Indios Pablos, by which they meant the nomadic tribes of, of New Mexico, the people that didn't live in villages like the, uh, the Navajos and the Apache, who, um, were more traditional, hunters um, uh, and, 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 and gatherers, right? Um, but the, the Puebloans had, you know, extensive irrigation and, and enormously sophisticated farming systems that took advantage of, um, well, that, that, had, that had to be very inventive, given, as you know, how little it rains out here, right? Uh, but they were very successful farmers for thousands of years because they knew this landscape better than anybody, and they knew how to live sustainably from it. Here's a, another question. Uh, do you want to um, read this question, Henry? Um, how are the Tiwa at Tortugas or Las Cruces related to Isleta? Okay, so that's a really interesting question. Um, and, and I don't know that I know the answer to it. I think that's a question that is best asked of, of, the, uh, of the Tortugas people in Las Cruces and of the Tiguas in El Paso, right? Um, this, this is family history. And you're asking, well, who's related to who? And, and there are different things that you read about, um, about where they, they came from. If they were part of that original group that came down, the several hundred that came down with the Spaniards in 1680, if they were related in other ways to, um, uh, you know, and, and, then, and then spread out from there after they came down here. Um, but that's, that's a question I think we should, you know, uh, we should go out. Well, not now. I think now we should stay home. But I think eventually... <laughs> We should go down to Isleta del Sur Pueblo and, and ask some of these questions because these are, again, this, this is history that belongs to Puebloan peoples and, 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 and that's, that's their question to answer. I, 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 and I don't, I, I don't really know. I've got a question for you, Robert. Um, I, I loved earlier how you talked about some of the parallels between the Pueblo Revolt and the American Revolution. Um, and I also liked that you talked about how unique this was in – um, the history of contact that an indigenous people were able to throw off the yoke yeah. of the colonizers and literally drive them physically hundreds of miles out of their land and, and, and do that for, for 12 years. Um, I, I want to ask you how unique that is. I, my understanding is that the Comanches were able to do um, something um, similar uh, in yeah. terms of driving Spanish and other European colonizers and invaders out for a very long time. And, you know, Comancheria was, um, you know, impassable. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that empire, which is maybe not the right word, uh, was, was also maybe kind of a, a, an extraordinary, not typical, um, you know, turn of events where Native people were able to get the upper hand on European colonizers. C can you talk about either how rare this is or, or if it was more common than we assume yeah. it to be? So um, I, I think you're absolutely right with the, the Comanches who were the military force in the, the Southern Great Plains um, for, for hundreds of years. I think the big difference here that we're talking about is, uh, well, two things. One is um, Greater Comancheria was uh, defensible for them because they were um, 
They were such powerful, uh, such a powerful military presence, so much so that the the Spaniards um, and and after them uh, the Mexicans and after them the Americans uh, had trouble getting a foothold into that country. They just simply couldn't penetrate into it, where uh, and establish um, uh, control over military control over. Whereas in New Mexico, what you're looking at is a colonial system and a missionary system working hand in glove to um, establish control over a vast geography. And they did so for decades and decades and decades. So that difference, I think, stands out to me. Um, it's not unique in terms of, uh, in fact, it anticipates a lot of other pan-Indian movements that you see in the 19th century, in the 18th and 19th century, uh, thinking in the Great Lakes region with Pontiac and his Confederacy. And after him, I think the, the resemblance that I always think about is between Pope and, is uh, between him and Tecumseh and his brother Tenskwatawa. And Pope kind of combines who Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa was. Tecumseh was this incredibly gifted diplomat who spread a message of pan-Indian resistance to the white people, chiefly the Americans at that point, uh, from, from their home in, in Indiana and across the Great Lakes region. But he did so in uh, conjunction with his brother, Tenskwatawa, who was a religious leader who also preached the, uh, the need to return to traditional lifeways and to tradi traditional religious practices, to throw off the yoke of missionary activity, right? Pope is sort of both of these guys at one. He is, uh, you know, he went to these 45 different Pueblos totally in secret. The Spaniards had no idea what he was up to. Um, and he makes his argument across all of these linguistic barriers to all these different people um, who have their differences and, 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 and makes a convincing case for the need for pan, uh, for common resistance, right? But he does so also uh, motivated very strongly by his own um, religious message and the need to purify um, religious spiritual practice uh, for, um, for, for Pueblo peoples as well. Uh, Tecumseh though and Tenskwatawa, although they are remarkably successful in what they achieve, can't do what has happened in New Mexico. They are unable to dislodge the Americans or the British and Canadians to the north. Um, too much uh, time has passed. There are too many Americans around. And, and the Americans, um, there are just too many at that point. They, they can't achieve what, um, what, the, what, the, uh, what the Pueblos did in, in 1680. No one can. This happens, keep in mind, this happened 1680. This is four years after the end of King Philip's War, a far more well-known war in New England. When King Philip met a comet, tries to, to unite um, Wampanoags and Narragansetts uh, and so forth yeah, to, to expel the British once and for all, if they can, who are, you know, um, uh, bringing terrible suffering to, to the people of New England. And, and he is unsuccessful. Um, that was the last, sort of the, the last big chance they had to do that in New England. Uh, but the numbers at that point proved prohibited. There are just too many of them. They kept on coming. As well, eventually it proved for the people in the Southwest, after 1692, there were just too many Spaniards. But things changed, right? Things changed after 1692. The old encomienda system was not reinstalled. The demand by the, the, the missionaries that they end their traditional practices was not re, reinstated. They established a more, um, uh, the, one of the, I think, the, the permanent gains of the Pueblo Revolt was the establishment of a principle of autonomy for, for these pueblos, such that they could be left alone to a degree to, um, to practice their own uh, religion and to, um, and to lead their, their own lives, right? Um, so that, that's, uh, that's what I, 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 I would, would add to that. It's, even though it ended, the effects are, are long lasting and they are something that I think Pueblo peoples are, are rightfully proud of to this day. Uh, Henry's going to read you this question from Lex. Uh, okay. There was another question that came in, not through the formal question, but just in the comments. Um, you're welcome to take it or leave it. Is a hot dog a sandwich? That That's <laughs> something you don't have to answer. Henry, do you want to read this one? I need to enlist my kids on this one. Um, I, I, need, I need more minds to attack this one. Henry, Granny, I need your help. All right, Henry, will you read this one? Do I have a book or recommendation on the Pueblo Runners? Oh, man. Um, no, I wish I did. If you, if you find out, let me know. Um, I think that would be a really fascinating thing to read. But the, the, the runners in this part of the world, 
as a lot of people know, are, are world famous. The Tarahumara runners south of here are... Uh, uh, okay, here, here's my question. I want to read that book, though, so I want to know. But for now, uh, and we need to get all of our minds here uh, in, in Shea O'Rourke and Shea Gun here together. Um, Gun Perillo, kid, mm -hmm. is a hot dog a sandwich? Mm, yes. Wow. No, no, it isn't. It is not, it is not a sandwich. <laughs> Okay. Well, there's there's two sides of bread and a meat yeah, in between. And a sandwich is two sides of bread and then something inside. But is yeah, I, yeah, I feel like, like that's true like a in a narrow sandwich. definition. Is Subway sandwich? Or is it a taco? Yeah. It doesn't even count as bread. Like I feel like that gives short trip to the hot dog. Yeah, like, will no one though. acknowledge the the glorious differences that weird tube shape that it has? And it's got to well, count for something. Also, the fact that it's so fake if. Barely even bread or meat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know you <laughs> hey, Robert, we're, we're so grateful that you did this today. It was so nice of you. Yeah. And I could just tell from the, the comments that came through, people really appreciate it. We have uh, a friend who's on from another part of the country, Skylar, who's taking a, a class on Native American history. And she says she really appreciates this. Um, there are folks oh, cool. who have their kids on. Um, there's some kids that we recognize from Henry and Molly's school who've been um, texting their their appreciation as well. And so we would love at some point, if you're up for it again, to have you on again. Uh, and then also, if yeah. anyone who's watching this um, recommends other great minds like Robert's that want to share their wisdom on a given subject oh, for the O'Rourke Homeschool for the Gifted, we'd love to have you on as well. We'd love to share it with uh, everyone else who's homeschooling their kids right now. So uh, we're grateful to you guys. We hope that you are taking care of each other uh, and staying home and not getting together with other people yet. We'll do that at some point down the road. We want we want to see you guys in person, but it, it sure is nice to see you by video and to see that impressive beard yeah. that your dad has. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, well, and we'll see if this, if this lasts uh, through the quarantine. Uh, um, it's, 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 it's a kind of, it's, it's an ill-advised, you know, pseudo medical experiment of my own. Um, yeah, so we'll see. We'll see. We, we love it. Um, well, love you guys and we'll see you I see soon. you have the good sense, all of you, to like go to the barber before all of it. Bye, Bye. Bye you guys. And, and for, for folks watching, um, we're going to be back on again at 4.30 Mountain Standard Time with Andy Slavitt, um, uh, one of the most informed knowledgeable voices on healthcare in this country right now. If you've got questions for Andy Slavitt, he'll be on at 4.30 Mountain Time, uh, 5.30 Central, and you're welcome to join us. Robert, you should join us as well and ask him some tough questions. I will. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you. All right, Adios. you guys. I'll see you guys soon. Hello. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Franny. All right. Uh, class is over, Molly. What do we do now? Uh, huh? Uh, we're, we're still on. Yeah. So what what's next? Um, okay. Do we want to show? We'll, we'll show the chicks later. Um, yeah. Okay. Real quick. All right. Real quick, since we've got two minutes left in the class, go show and tell. Okay. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Hey, uh, I, I saw some comments from some of you and some questions posed about how we get rid of obnoxious trolling commentators. I don't mind people who are critical. I don't mind people who have a different point of view, but, but people who are ugly or rude or mean uh, or vicious, um, uh, I found the way to mute them. So um, that's, thanks for, for your patience on that. Um, we figured that out. Like this guy, uh, Michael, who says, your dad isn't smart. Well, you know, that's really nice, Michael. Uh, here we go. All right, who, who are we going to show? Uh, I'm going to show mine first. Hey, okay, I guess I'll show him first. Okay, that's Fluffy. My brother named him. And then this is Chipmunk. This is Chipmunk. Can you hold him? Okay. This is Stella Luna. Um, uh, she's a bantam. 
uh, Bantam. Uh, I forgot what this one is. This is loud. <gasps> oh.